Good morning, East Rockaway Nazarene. It's, this is a little different how we're going to be doing things for the next couple of weeks. I'm certainly glad that you can tune in and watch and enjoy the message as uh, I've spent some time seeking God's face. And I hope that this message will be an encouragement to all of us as we think about true love and how much God really loves us. I'd ask you if you would turn with me in your Bibles. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes or at least a couple of seconds just to find the scripture. Uh, maybe on your phone. Um, for in the future, maybe just have your Bible ready that, that as we look at God's Word that we're going to spend some time in it and read it together. So 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. I'm reading from the NIV this morning. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason that the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. And so we want to focus um, this morning specifically on 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, but then we're going to look at the other verses as well. But this is our, our text for this morning. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it didn't know Him. Because we're living in such difficult times, church, this morning, um, I think we need to just go to the Lord in prayer, and let's just seek God's face together. Why don't we do that just for a moment? Father, as we look at your word, I pray that you would just speak to us this morning and that we would be encouraged and we would be strengthened in our faith and in our resolve to serve you even in the midst of this pandemic, that we would look to you, the author and the finisher of our faith, that we could be encouraged through your word this morning. So we invite you that by your Holy Spirit, even through technology, that you would speak to us today. Jesus, in your matchless and most holy name we pray, all to your glory, Father. Amen. Church, I want to encourage you this morning to remain positive in this horrible situation, knowing that this situation, even as it began, will also one day, as soon, sooner than later, I hope, come to an end. Remember that God knows exactly what's going on. Nothing has caught God by surprise. Nothing ever catches God off guard. This is in itself should give all of us hope this morning and confidence as we face every single day, even as we are at home alone and we isolate ourselves. Remember that God hasn't left you, that He's always there. The Apostle Peter wrote, say, saying, Cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. The Apostle Paul also wrote to the believers at Philippi, and he told them not to be anxious about everything. He said, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I want you to notice something, and I want to see if you really pick that up. You see what, 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 he, what he was saying, that if we bring everything to the Lord in prayer, with thanksgiving, that is every situation, including this COVID-19, that disease that came and is just causing such havoc in the United States and all around the world. We can find and we will have the peace of God guarding our hearts and our minds as we trust Him with everything concerning our lives. Jesus Himself said on several occasions, He told us not to fear. The psalmist wrote many times that we shouldn't fear. Look what the psalmist said in Psalm 56. When I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. What a beautiful answer for us today. Even the prophets wrote, saying, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, and I will help you, and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Just these few passages and many, many more. If you ever want to do an exercise, you could go look these up and even do a Google search on that, how to be encouraged in times of anxiety. These few passages and many more reveal how much God actually loves each one of us, how much God loves you and cares for you even as you watch. This morning as we continue our study in 1 John, we will discover that God really does deeply love and care for each one of us. During the 1960s, many of the flower children in the hippie movement spoke of free love. And in that movement, I can uh, thinking back, and I wasn't part of 
um, Woodstock or anything like that. But if you think back to those days and what was going on, some in the movement would carry placards that had three simple words on it that would say, God is love. Their message was that true life consists not in material possessions, but in love. Well, that's a truism, but unfortunately, many of the young people contorted the expression that, uh, of, of God is love to love is God, meaning that anything that they, that they called love had to be God. And that is a distortion, and it's sort of back to front. The truth is that love by any definition is not God, absolutely not. John's statement that God is love means that God fi filled with loving kindness and compassion, that God himself is the very nature and the essence of love. The Greek word for love here has nothing to do with sex, romance, not even friendship. John exclusively used the word in his, in his text, the word agape, which, which describes his divine love for us. This love speaks of compassion, regard, and kindness. It is this love that motivated God in giving his son to the world to die for you and I, for our sins, because we were separated from God. It is this kind of love that we can experience when we become part of God's family. It is this unselfish love that transcends natural affinities. It is a love that doesn't come naturally, but comes through the divine nature of which you and I who are believers can partake of at the new birth, the moment we find Jesus as our Lord and Savior. It is with this new nature that people can truly love one another with the love of God. So firstly, what we want to look at is that God's love for us is absolutely unique. There's no other love other than the uniqueness of God's love for us. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, we, we could translate that in, in, in terms that we can maybe understand a little easier, where the writer could say, Behold, what peculiar, out-of-this-world kind of love the Father has bestowed upon us, because it's nothing that you and I find in the world today other than in the personhood of God. There are two English words which are closely connected but whose meaning are widely different. And the words are paternity and fatherhood. Paternity describes a relationship in which a man is responsible for the physical existence of his child, whereas fatherhood describes the intimate loving relationship between a father and their children. While we were enemies with God, of God, and we were living separated from God in sin. The scripture declares for us in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, that God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God's wonderful, wonderful, and amazing redemptive plan of salvation began with the love of God. Right from the very word go, remember that God loves you. There is no greater subject in all the world that we can ever think of other than God's love and how amazing that is. This means that God is not afar off or absent and unreachable in some distant place, some far away. No, God wants to be intimately involved in your life right there where you're sitting, right there where you're together. It means that God is not a vengeful God. He doesn't cause all the bad things to happen to us, things like accidents, even diseases, and even our health when our health goes awry. It means that God is not hovering over us, looking for every little mistake that we make so that he can punish us. That's not the nature of God. But on the contrary, God, because of his great love for us, means that he is bound to show us his love and act on the behalf of all of us that love him. You see, God's love for us literally means that God cares and looks after each one of us. Secondly, it also means that God will help us through whatever trial of life that we have. Why? Because He loves us. Because God loves us, He will help us through all the temptations of, the, of life. And God will save us from sin, evil, corruption, and the death that we find in this world. God also, because of His great love, will provide a way for us to be delivered from the coming judgment of His holy wrath against sin. Isn't that amazing? Because of His love, we don't stand condemned but we stand forgiven because of his great love for us that we find in Jesus. God loves us and has demonstrated his love to us in sending Jesus. Then we must expect us to respond to that love. So if God so loved us so much, we have to then accept Christ's love in our lives and we respond to that love. How do we respond? Love expects to be loved in return. 
And it's an amazing fact that even if we don't love God, His love still pursues us, still desires us to come to know Him. To know love, we must receive love and share it. God's love, uh, God loves us so much, but we have to receive His love in order for each one of us to actually experience God's love. We respond to God's love by entering into a loving relationship with Him through Jesus Christ, His beloved. In order to know and experience that love, we have to have a relationship with Jesus. If we do not love God, then we can never know and experience His love for us. It is absolutely essential for us to truly love God and if we wish to experience that love. It is almost reciprocal. If we love God, we will experience His love because He first loved us. There really aren't that many people who truly love God in the world today. So they walk through life without knowing God's love and care. And how sad is that? They have to face all the terrible trials and temptations of life alone, having no help except what man can give them, simply because they've rejected God's amazing love. We must pray for those that, haven't know, that don't know God's love as yet, and you will meet them all the time. They have, they have to face the suffering and the sorrow and death of loved ones all alone because they don't have the supernatural love power of God to help them because they have rejected His love. They have, no, they have no comfort when death comes knocking. Without really knowing God, they have no assurance of what's waiting for them on the other side. Sadly, they have no hope beyond this life. They feel that this life might be all there is, but yet perhaps deep inside, they're still not quite sure, wondering if perhaps there might be something after this life. And maybe you this morning, as you're watching, maybe you thinking the same thing. I really don't believe in God, but let me tell you, there is life after death, and it's an amazing life, as the Scriptures declare. The list of things that a person has to face alone, if they don't know the love of God, we could have a list that probably would go on and on and on. Thankfully, though, however, God loves the world, and that includes each one of you. God loves you so much that He sent His Beloved. That is love, that the perfect sacrifice of God, His perfect Son, gave His life for us. What an amazing, amazing love that is. Therefore, if any of us who want to know God's love and care, God gives us that opportunity. Even at this very moment, you can turn to God and say, Lord, I want to love you and I want to know how much you love me. I give my life to you. Maybe you're thinking about that or maybe you've been contemplating that for some time. All we really have to do is to respond to His amazing love and His invitation to love Him in return, opening up our lives, receiving His love, and loving Him. God's love also, secondly, tells us who we are. Also in, in verse 1, I just want to re, 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 reread that for you. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. We are the children of God. And the reason that the world does not know us is that it didn't know Him. We have a great privilege, you and I, and everyone that loves the Lord, of knowing God's love. In fact, the whole world can know God's love. The privilege is being called children of God. You, when, you know, when you love God and you have experienced Him, you become a child of God. Think for a moment how astounding this actually is. Being called a child of the supreme majesty, the, of, of intelligence and power of the universe, the one who actually created everything that you and I can experience or even see. John makes two significant points here. Number one is that God's love bestowed on us gives us the privilege of adoption. We are adopted into the family of God with all the rights and privileges that Jesus himself has from the Father. Look what the Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. And God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were lost and separated from, from God and from His love, Jesus took the punishment of our sin upon Himself that you and I this morning can know and experience God's amazing love. This is what makes God's love so wonderful. While we were rebelling and opposing God, while we were still enemies of God, God bestowed His love on us through the Lord Jesus Christ. 
When Jesus died, He paid the penalty for our sins, for your sins, for my sin. And that penalty was then removed from us because we are now covered by the, the sacrifice and the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus frees us from the dominion of death and sin. Therefore, God is able to accept us into His family because of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. God is able to adopt us as His children. In, in verse 12 of John chapter 1, we, we read, Yet to all who did receive Him, to those who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. We only become a true child of God the moment we give our lives to Him, when we surrender our lives, when we believe that what the Scripture declares about Jesus to be true. Secondly, the world doesn't know or understand believers, and how true is that? How many people have you encountered, perhaps even someone that's watching with you right now, really doesn't understand how you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? This explains why believers are so oftentimes ridiculed and mocked. They are ignored or abused, rejected and persecuted by the world because people do not understand God's love. Jesus said, Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. And if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. See, the world doesn't understand why believers act the way they live. And, and conduct themselves the way they do. The world doesn't understand why believers separate themselves from the things of the world, things that, that, that may entertain people that don't know God. So believers don't want to be part of that. The world doesn't understand why believers deny themselves and live sacrificial lives so that they can carry out the message of Jesus to the world and meet the needs of, the, of, of, of those who are so desperate. The world doesn't understand why believers go to church so much and talk so much about Jesus. Isn't that amazing? When you meet a fellow believer, that's what we talk about. We talk about how wonderful God is and how amazing God is. That's our conversation. It's always like our conversation revolves around the love and the goodness of God. Ultimately, the world doesn't understand believers because it doesn't know Jesus in a very personal way. You that know Jesus, you are so blessed and you are so fortunate to know Him today and to know the love of God. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 14 and verse 16, he says these words, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear His name. What a powerful scripture that we can think about. So the next time someone mocks you or ridicules you, remember that you are blessed because your name is associated with the name of Jesus. The world doesn't understand that believers are the children of God and that they can live no other way than following God's tenets, following God's directives. Thirdly, God's love promises Jesus' return. Christ is coming again, and perhaps this is a forerunner. We don't know, but it surely makes us contemplate and think about perhaps this is it. Maybe Jesus is coming sooner than we think. He wrote in verse 2, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. What an amazing and awesome day that will be. This is the great hope and the mystery of God's love. Let's look at John's great declaration of who we are. We are already God's children. It's not that we will become God's children. We actually are God's children at this very moment. As you are watching here and you might be sitting with someone, look at them and say, listen, I'm a child of God. Go ahead, just tell them that right now. I'm a child of God. I know God and I know His love. If you have trusted and given your life to Jesus Christ, you are now in the present, this very moment, children of God. God's love for us doesn't stop with the new birth, but continues throughout our lives and takes us right up until the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, perhaps even in our lifetime. Look at the latter part of this. What we will be has not yet been known, 
But we know that when Christ appears, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. You see, church, God is light. And therefore, when we see God face to face, his light will be transmitted to us, and we will become like him. Well, some of you say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, Pastor Steve, that, that can't happen. Well, look what the scripture says. You see, one day when Jesus Christ comes again, we will be just like Jesus, conforming to his image. This is what the writer says in Philippians chapter 3. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. That is miraculous. That is so amazing that we will become like Christ. Not that we will ever be Jesus. Don't get me wrong. We will never be Jesus but we will become like him. We are adopted into the family of God with all the rights and privileges that God has given. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 49, Paul says, And just as we have, be, have borne the image of the earthly man, so we shall bear the image of the heavenly man. That heavenly man here is Jesus. Our body which is corruptible will become incorruptible. Our body will not be a body of dishonor, but will be a resurrected body or a changed body if Jesus comes, a body of glory. It will not be a weak body, but a body that is raised in power. We will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, the scriptures declare. John tells us that we are what we, what, what we, we at least John tells us that we are and what we shall be in this passage. Fourthly, the great motive of God's love is purity. John also tells us what we should be right now, how we should conduct ourselves, even as we find ourselves alone at home. Maybe some of you are getting frustrated. By now you probably have some little inklings of cabin fever and what that might feel like. Um, but hang in there. God has not deserted you. God has not left you. John tells us how we should be conducting our lives and how we should live. God wants his children to be just like himself, a people who are pure and holy and righteous. God loves you so much right now, this very moment, that he wants you to live with him in fellowship and communion, worshiping and serving him forever and ever. Even where you are, you can worship him and serve him and love him. Just as Chris is, has sung those few songs this morning, we can worship him and serve him and love him. This is the very reason that God saved you in Jesus Christ and has given you a great hope of being eternally transformed so that you can and will live with Him in glory. Church, beloved, your salvation and your redemption from the start to the finish is the very expression of the love of God for you. Yes, we are saved by God's grace through Jesus Christ, but the provision for our salvation originated with the love of God started with the love of God for his creation, for you and I that are created in his image. Consider for a moment how much God has done. He's done so much for you. He's loved you with an incredible, an unquenchable, and an unchangeable love. That's how much he loves you. And when we fully grasp that, it will stir us to live as Christ lived. We will have no desire to continue living in sin. And when we do sin, we go against God's magnificent love. And when we consider God's amazing love, we will want to purify ourselves, to be pleasing to God while we still inhabit this earth. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. When we live the life that is pleasing, we will see God when our life is pleasing to Him. We must seek to be pure, and even as Christ Jesus is pure. Paul again said in 2 Corinthians 7, Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. We revere God in the way that we live our lives. This is the proof that we really love God, is when we revere Him and we honor Him in the way that we live, the way that we think, the way that we communicate, the way that we conduct our lives. Do you understand God's incredible love for you? Do you really understand it? Have you grasped it? Or are you this morning still struggling to understand that? Are you stirred to live pure lives because of His incredible love for you? 
There was once a group of teenagers who were joining a party, and someone suggested that they go to a certain club right after the party, just to continue to having a great and good time. I'd rather you took me home, Jen said to her date. My parents wouldn't approve of that. Afraid that your father will hurt you, one of the girls asked sarcastically. No, Jen replied. I'm not afraid that my father will hurt me. He loves me, but I'm afraid that I might hurt him. You see, that's what real love is about. Jen had understood what love is all about. The very principle of a true child of God who's experienced God's love firsthand has no desire to sin against that kind of love. And that's what love is all about, church. So, beloved, this morning, be encouraged. Be encouraged while you're at home. Be encouraged as, you, as, as maybe some of you have been isolated, that God loves you so very, very, very much. And He will take care of you. He will look after you. He will be with you through every trial that you are facing. For every trial that you may face, you see, that is true love. I want to close with this passage from Deuteronomy. And this is where we wrap it up and we understand how much God loves us. The Lord himself goes before you and he will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid nor be discouraged. Let's take heart in that scripture. Let's pray it back to the Lord. Father, thank you for your word this morning. And Lord, we thank you that you go before us, that you will be with us, that you will never forsake us, and that we don't have to be afraid, nor be discouraged. Lord, we thank you for your great love. And Lord, may we this morning experience that new love, that, that love of yours, perhaps afresh, as we turn to you and, and declare our love for you, our adoration for you. Encourage your people, Lord Jesus, wherever they might be, whoever's listening in, whoever will listen to this in the, in the coming days, may they find strength and courage, Lord, because they realize how much you love them and how much you care for them. And may we have the ability through your spirit who lives in us to love you back, Lord, to the very best of our abilities through your spirit. Lord Jesus, we pray these things in these times. Walk with us. Draw us close. Lift us up and carry us. Bless your people, Lord Jesus. Keep your hand on us.